Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Lippincott, and I'm here to talk about the Principia Mathematica and the foundations of arithmetic in C++. Um, but first, a note about the title. Uh, you might think I'm being rather bold in titling my talk in Latin, and I'll cop to that. Um, for those of you who don't know Latin, principles of mathematics, or mathematical principles, something like that. Um, you might think I'm being very bold indeed by titling my talk after Isaac Newton's work, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, from which we get a lot of our basic physics. Um, I am not. Um, that's not where I got my title. I got it from Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell's work, Principia Mathematics, published in the early 1900s. And I took this title because I think of this talk as taking a similar place for C++ that this work did for mathematics. Um, so this is the, I think it's fair to say, the, the triumph of a philosophy of mathematics called logicism. The idea that mathematics is based on logic. Um, which at the time was a fairly new idea um, that mathematics and logic were so intimately connected. Uh, the Principia Mathematica builds up mathematics in exacting detail from first principles. It's written in a very formal language. It's pretty difficult to read. It's very detailed um, and very um, you know, notation heavy, um, but it builds up from principles of logic the way you do mathematics. And to give you a sense of how detailed it is, uh, this, this is not any random page from the Principia. This is a famous page. Uh, this is page 86 of volume two, and it is a page on which we have the proof that one plus one is equal to two a proposition that Russell and Whitehead find occasionally useful. So the Principia moves a bit slowly. I'm going to try and do a similar thing for C++ in 90 minutes. Um, so to do this, I have to take a few shortcuts. I'm going to summarize a lot. I'm going to try and speak as very quickly. I'm going to use a hundred years of mathematical hindsight that Russell and Whitehead did not have. Um, particularly, I'm going to talk about type theory, newly invented by Bertrand Russell when this was published. So if you like types, you can thank Bertrand Russell. Um, and I'm also going to use some category theory, which wouldn't be invented for 40 or 50 years. Um, and I do have one more advantage, which brings us to the other part of, our, of my title, the foundations of arithmetic in C++. English is not a formal language. And not being a formal language, it has ambiguous phrases like the foundations of arithmetic in C++, which can be read in two different ways. I could be talking about the foundations of the way arithmetic is done in C++, or I could be talking about the foundations of arithmetic and expressing myself in C++ as a formal language. I'm going to do both. Doing both does have some advantages. Talking about C++ in, in a language that is very much C++ keeps you on target. You know that you're talking about the same thing every time you say something. Um, but I'm going to go through um, the arithmetic operations in C++ and try to explain how they all work using C++ as my formal language. It's a much more, uh, it's a much better language for um, actual use than any language that was available in the early 1900s. 
uh, formal languages also fairly new then. Um, and um, they weren't very well developed, and they certainly weren't intended for people to use routinely the way so many people use C++ today. Um, so that's another advantage I have. Uh, the principal extension that I'm going to make to C++ is I'm going to write function interfaces. This is the syntax I use for a function interface. It's a block of code. It's divided into two parts, a prologue and an epilogue by this implementation statement in the middle. The caller of the function is responsible for everything that happens in the prologue. The caller has to get execution through the prologue. The implementation of the function runs then and is responsible for everything in the epilogue. So the preconditions go in the prologue, the post conditions go in the epilogue. Ah, and I'm going to try and write function interfaces for all of these arithmetic operations in C++. Uh, so let's begin with the basics. There are three basic principles that, you, that functions need to interact with in order to convey their meaning to, the, the, to their callers. And those three principles are stability, substitutability, and repeatability. So stability is the idea that over certain periods, an objects will hold a stable state, and because they are holding a stable state, they will have a stable value. That is, you can read from that object repeatedly, get the same result. Um, and functions have a few interactions with that. Some functions begin a period of stability, like a constructor begins a period of stability for an object. Some end a period of stability, a destructor, but also something like assignment will end a period of stability, but begin another period of stability. There's a gap between two periods of stability when you do an assignment. Um, and still other functions are only callable during a period of stability. They require a promise from their caller that objects will be held stable for the duration of the operation. So that's stability. Substitutability is a good deal simpler. That's just the idea that at certain points in a program, um, we have two different objects of the same type that have the same value, that one, one's value can be used in place of the other's value. So that's substitutability. Um, and repeatability is the idea that to a certain extent, when we repeat an operation, um, we get the same result. Um, and if we're writing a good function interface, we have to describe what it means to repeat the function, uh, the function call and what the consequences of repeating the function call are. How alike are the results? So those are the three basics. We'll start with stability. Um, here, for these items marked in pink, um, the, these parameters, the caller must transfer a right of stability to the implementation to use these operations. Um, the caller knows that the, that the object is stable before the operation, but gives up that knowledge, gives up its, the promise it, that has been made to it to keep the object stable so that it may change. Um, and at the end of the operation, the implementation transfers back to the caller a new right of stability. There is a new promise that these objects will remain stable for a time. Um, by contrast, the other parameters are covered by an immunity from instability. Uh, the, these parameters, the caller must assure the implementation that the state of these objects will remain stable for the duration of the operation. Um, so these are basically the const parameters, the things passed by values. Um, and 
Um, so that's most of what we're going to say about stability. It's fairly simple for these operations, but there is one more thing. Um, each of these operations creates a new object as its result. And when we're creating a new object and giving it a value, to communicate this value, we also have to give the caller a right of stability to this object. The, the caller knows that these objects, starting as the operation ends, will remain stable for some period after the call. So that's for the function results. The other fun functions do not create a new object as a function result. So moving on, substitutability. Um, in these cases, uh, so um, the objects that are not creating a function result actually do have a function, pass a function result reference that is aliased to one of the parameters. So in each of these cases, the result of the function is the, it refers to the same object as one of the parameters. That is a form of substitutability. It's substitutability of pointers. Um, the address of the result is substitutable for the address of that parameter. So this is how we are going to express aliasing substitutability of pointers to the object. There is a little bit more substitutability that we'll see. Um, in the, for these operations, there's a claim of substitutability as a post condition. These, these operations um, either cause or note that two objects have the same value. Um, after an assignment, the two objects, the two parameters will have the same value. Um, after a, an equality comparison, if the result of the equality comparison is true, then the two objects have the same value. Um, and after a comparison for inequality, if the result is false, the two objects will have the same value. So this is how we're going to use, is where we're going to get our substitutability from, mostly from assignment or comparisons for equality. I will say that there's a bit of a code smell on this slide. Putting if statements in your interface is almost always bad design. If you have an if statement in your interface, that means that your caller, need, every caller, will need to do some work to figure out exactly what the interface is. Either it has to make a decision which interface it wants. If the if statement is in, is a, a pre, in a pre, the prologue for preconditions, if the if statement is in a post condition like this, the caller actually has to branch on the result to know what the full post condition was. So um, I am putting it in conditional substitutability here um, as kind of a judgment call that maybe it's okay in this one case. Um, and in fact, when I look at a lot of code, almost all equality or inequality comparisons are followed by an if, are followed by a branch. The, the caller is going to branch on the result and know that there's substitutability on one branch but not the other. So that's substitutability for all of these operations. I will say there, there's a little bit more. Um, I'm, some of the other operations will, many of the other operations will have some substitutability involved in their um, post conditions, but I'm going to get that through the back door by claiming equality, and equality will get a substitutability when it is true. Um, okay, for repeatability, there are two aspects to repeatability. Um, how alike does a call have to be to a previous call in order to repeat it? And how alike will the results be when the call is repeated. And I describe these as discernible input and discernible output. Um, if the discernible input to a call is the same, then the call is being repeated. 
And if the call is being repeated, the discernible output must be the same. So the, if the caller arranges for the discernible input to an operation to be the same a second time, the implementation must arrange for the discernible output to be the same. And here, essentially all parameters on, for these operations are part of the discernible input. And in fact, that's the entirety of the discernible input. There is one exception. The left-hand operand of assignment is not part of the discernible input. That object doesn't even need to have a value. Um, the discernible input is just the right-hand side for assignment. And the discernible output is also very simple for the arithmetic operations. Um, for every operation, the value of the result is the discernible output, is part of the discernible output. It is, for almost all operations, the, the full discernible output. It is, a, it is the only thing you can expect to be the same afterwards if you repeat the call. Um, but there are two operations down here in the corner that have two parts to their output. They, have, they return a result and they um, modify one of their parameters. So those two are special. They have extra discernible output. Um, with that, we have enough tools to talk about how assignment between and, and two integers works. Um, here is the interface for assignment between two integers. Um, on the way in, the caller must transfer away the right to stability of the left-hand operand. The caller must extend an immunity to the right-hand operand. And you'll notice that I'm passing the right-hand operand by value in this case. Um, by Passing it, by, uh, passing it by value, I avoid the, al the possibility that the two might be aliased, and that lets me keep the prolog from having a branch in it. So I prefer it without the branch. Um, and finally, the discernible input to this operation is the, the right-hand parameter. On the way out, um, we have Substitutability of address between A and the result, that's aliasing. We provide a, the, a new right of stability to that object that is referred to by both A and by the result. Um, so a new period of stability is beginning. And the value of the result is the discernible output, as I promised. Um, and finally, there is that one extra thing, the thing that gives assignment its meat, um, which is that the result and the right-hand parameter are substitutable for each other. They will have the same value after an assignment. So that's assignment, or rather it would be in a far simpler language. But that's just assignment for int, and I promised you integer math. Um, C++ has a wealth of integer types. These are the standard integer types. Um, and we also imagine that particular implementations might add extended integral types to the, to the language they compile. So there might be a great many integral types. And of course, we're going to have to deal with them in bulk. Um, there's, for all of these types, there's really two parameters that tell you everything about an integral type. And that is whether it is unsigned or signed, and what the width of the parameter of the type is, the number of bits in it. And that tells you how the type is going to behave mathematically. Um, so if we know those things, we know the math of the type. Um, and I'm going to collect those two properties into a type itself, which I'm going to call the integer kind. The integer kind is the width and whether or not it is signed. Um, 
And so you'll be seeing this throughout the talk. Anytime I talk about the kind of an integer, it means this structure that has two degrees of freedom. And the main reason for talking about integer kind as a, as a type of its own um, is that there's an ordering on integer kinds. I can talk about one kind fitting within another one is the usual way to think about it. You often think, does this, do these in, uh, does this uh, collection of integer values fit within another, uh, another type? Is, is the type bigger? Um, and of course, this is a partial ordering because it's multidimensional and multidimensional orderings tend to be partial orderings. Um, and it's you, you might think, be thinking containment. This is, is one type contained within another. And that's, I said that, but it's not a good thing to say. Um, it, it leads to mistakes. Um, you shouldn't think of types being contained with, within each other. Types are entirely separate from each other. You have to embrace that to make type theory work. Um, no value actually has two types. Instead, what we have are functions that closely connect types. And the particular function that closely connects types is, that we're going to see a lot of today is this function I'm calling convert. Um, and it has a requires clause. And that's why we needed that ordering. The ordering lets us know whether a nice conversion exists from one type to the other. So don't think of the ordering as containment. Think of it as the existence of a nice conversion. Um, and the nice conversions form a category that looks something like this. Ah. They go to increasing width. They go from unsigned to sign as long as, uh, as, long as you increase the width by one. Um, and so this ordering, this, this existence of nice conversions gives us a category. Um, and this helps us explain why we were thinking about containment in, in the beginning, because we might have been thinking, well, five, for example, is a number that exists in more than one integral type. Um, but that's because we're using a shorthand, and we often forget that we're using a shorthand. If we're being good, we put little subscripts on our fives, or little dangly bits off the end to say, this is five in a particular type, this is five in a the five of a different type. And those are different values because they are in different types. Um, but somehow we use the same name, five, for both of them. And why do we do that? Because we think that they are very much alike if there is some point where the nice conversions bring them together. So we give numbers the same first name without subscripts or whatever, when nice conversions bring them together. And that's sort of true, even for the fives in these lowest integral types, because we imagine that this sequence of types goes on into the distance. And category theoretically, we can take a co-limit of the diagram, and way off on the horizon, we find this glorious type Z. And if the five and these fives will map to the same place in Z, so we give them the same first name. Um, so that's our nice conversions. And I keep using this word nice with the conversion. Convert is nice conversion. Um, I keep the function name short so it's easy to type and you will use and people will use it because nice functions should have short names. Um, but 
And what makes, what makes it nice for us is it has this strong type requirement. No matter what value you throw at it, it'll convert properly. Um, but we are going to have some not so nice conversions. Um, we're going to have convert narrowing, a less pleasant name for a less pleasant function. And this one is for going the other way. It's for going against the grain in our diagram. It lets us go to a, uh, to a type where we don't have a nice conversion as long as we pick the, the parameters carefully. We're going to have a strong precondition on this function. If you, get the, if you pass in the wrong parameter, you're going to have undefined behavior. Um, so callers the caller for convert narrowing is responsible for picking values where the conversion will work. And there's one other conversion that we're going to see today, which is convert modular. And what convert modular has is instead of a strong precondition, it has a weak post condition. It only makes the low bits have the value you expect from a conversion. Um, now, I should say, um, modular arithmetic is a fine field of mathematics, but it is a field of mathematics that is not very well served by the way integral types work in C++. And in fact, for our purposes today, um, modular arithmetic, convert modular is just going to mean Sometimes you're going to get the wrong answer. Um, sometimes you'll do the conversion and get an answer that you can't really use for your ordinary arithmetic purposes. So that's seeing this one is a danger sign in today's talk. Um, so with that, we can actually take our interface for assignment and broaden it template-wise to assignment for any integral type. And we do that just by saying that instead of the result being directly substitutable for the right-hand side, it's substitutable for convert modular applied to the, to the right-hand side. We bring it to the, correct, to the type we need with convert modular, sometimes getting the wrong answer, turn on your warnings, Hopefully they'll save you. Um, and we say, OK, once you bring it to the correct type, then they will be substitutable. So that's assignment. We can go back to our list and blow assignment off of it. We've made some progress, except that we've added three more things to the list. So we've made negative progress. Um, but we'll make progress with the next step because there's a whole bunch of um, functions here that are covered by a single line in the standard, um, which says that the behavior of an expression of the form E1 op equals E2 is equivalent to E1 equals E1 op E2, except that E1 is evaluated only once. Um, I will say, if you're trying to um, write interfaces procedurally, except that is not your friend. Except that is you did a whole lot of things and you got to the end of the list and you say, well, go back and don't do those things. Um, you don't want this, but our syntax here for interfaces gets around it because we're going to leave evaluating the sub-expressions to our caller and just concentrate on the particular op equals um, operation. So um, our interface for this looks like this. It's a lot like what we've seen before. We've, we've got uh, a write and, and an immunity coming in. We have two discernible inputs. Um, and we compute an expected result from them using a different operation using the non-assigning version of the operation. And then at the very end of the interface, what we're going to say is that the result we get is substitutable for the result we expected. Um, now, I did do a little trick here 
which is I put the computation of the expected result in the prologue. That makes it the responsibility of the caller. If there are any preconditions that are needed to get through that computation, and there will be, it's the caller's problem to make sure that that compu computation can be done. The implementation is only responsible for making its result match that result. So um, that's assignment, or that, that's the compound assignment, except I did say I wasn't going to use substitutability here. This is that place where we come in and get substitutability by changing this to equality. I'm, I am claiming that these things are equal. That is specifically, I am claiming that the double equal operator applied to these things will return true. The interface for the double equal operator will, uh, will assure us that when it is returning true, the two things are substitutable. So that's substitutability through the back door. And coming back to our list, we can blow all of those things off the list um, and make it smaller. We do have a few operations that still modify things um, because they don't actually line up with the operations above. We don't have increment and decrement operations that don't modify a parameter. But we can invent them. So I'm going to invent a function next, which gives us the next, in, uh, the next integer, and use that to compute the expected result of plus plus. That makes that easy. Same deal, I'm going to invent prev, that gives us the resu expected result of minus minus. And these last two are a little more complicated because remember those are the two that are returning two discernible outputs. There's two outputs to these functions. There's an expected value for the result, but there's also an expected value for the left-hand parameter A. So here's what we will write. There's an expected result, there's an expected A, and in the epilogue we will claim that, the, that they are equal. Um, same deal for minus minus, just previous. So we've gotten rid of all the things that modify objects. From now on, we're, we're working in a more constish realm. Um, so, now we come to a part of the talk that I call unpleasant mucking about with types. Because there are some types here that I've highlighted that apparently we don't like to do in arithmetic with. Um, so the C++ standard, and it's something we get from C, avoids arithmetic in certain types um, through a process we call integral promotion. And the types we avoid are the ones that are smaller than int, character types, and any type that has the same width as int if it's not int or unsigned int. Those are the problem types that we're going to get rid of. Um, and we have, so these types are the ones we're going to get rid of. Um, and we have an algorithm for what type to convert to to do the math instead. Um, and it's a kind of complicated algorithm. There's a long list of choices. If you're using WCHAR T, CHAR 16 T, or CHAR 32 T, there's a much smaller list for the other types. And sometimes those can end up promoting to themselves, though, you know, those are the ones it didn't apply to. Um, and the standard gives you know, a lengthier explanation to this than this for how promotion works, but this is it. And we can actually write this in code. It's not my favorite code. Man, it, it made me use std conditional t. I don't like using std conditional t. If I wanted to write in Lisp, I would write in Lisp. Um, but yeah, this is a very Lispy way to figure out what type something promotes to. Um, and it almost works. 
there are a couple of problems. Uh, it gives the wrong answer for bit fields because the type of a bit field is a lie. And the type system embraces that lie and, um, you know, and tells us the bit field has a certain width which it does not. But the promotion mechanism pays attention to the actual width of the bit field. Um, and there's just no way to express that through a template that's computing types. Um, so um, this will give the wrong answer for bit fields because it's based on the lie that is the bit field's type. Um, it also doesn't work because underlying type doesn't work for the character types. Um, this is a case that's very unlikely to come up because you had to not be convertible to anything in that long list beforehand. Um, and particularly, I have never seen a WCHAR T that can't convert to either long, long or unsigned long, long. Those would be very, very wide characters. But it's not going to work because underlying type doesn't work for character types. I don't know if that's an oversight in the standard, but it's how it's written. Um, so in practice, you wouldn't actually write this mess. In practice, if you wanted to find out what something promotes to um, these days, you would write a much simpler thing and say, what does unary plus return? Because unary plus is the promotion operator. Um, and unary plus will give the right answer here, except for bit fields, because in this case, I did it through the type system. and the Bit field type is a lie. Um, so that's what you would use in ordinary practice for figuring out what the promoted type is. You just ask the compiler. Um, and with that, we can write a couple of concepts that are going to be useful for the, for the rest of the talk. Um, we have promoted integers and we have unpromoted integers. A promoted integer is one that promotion leaves alone, and an unpromoted integer is one that promotion changes. So we're going to be using those two concepts. Um, now, there is one place where you can't get away with this um, decal type deal for figuring out what the promoted type is. Um, and that is in the interface for operator plus, because it would be recursive. Um, here, I'm using, uh, I will go ahead and assume we have a promoted type template that works and write the interface for operator plus, and it's pretty simple. We compute the expected result by converting to the promoted type. That's all there is. Um, I should point out nice conversion. Promotion is always a nice conversion. So we're not doing too badly there. Um, and we can come back to our list of types or list of operations and take promotion off the list. Um, but we're going to try and avoid um, um, unpromoted types almost entirely. We're going to use the same trick for, the, for that in every, in every case. We're going to write an interface. This is a special interface just for unpromoted operands. So it has, we're, we're using that concept. And we're going to compute the expected result by first promoting and then applying the operation in the promoted type. And that's how we compute an expected result if we have an unpromoted operand. And with that, we can come back and split our list into two parts. Um, using that trick, we get rid of unpromoted operands for any of the promoted parameters, or for, any, for any of the arithmetic operations. But we are still going to need unpromoted operands for the conversions because we use conversions on unpromoted operands. Ah. So um, now we have the second half 
of unpleasant mucking about with types, which is the usual arithmetic conversions. We also hate doing math when the types of the two parameters don't match in a binary operation. Um, again, it's just a kind of random prejudice we inherit from C, but that's how we roll. Um, so in this case, I'm going to write a function that does what we call the usual arithmetic conversions to bring the two operands to the same type. And it's going to oper operate on two things, return a pair. And if they're the same type, we'll just return the pair. We'll, we'll just make them into a pair and be done with it. If they're different types, we're going to have to do something more complicated. So what's the more complicated thing? Well, we're going to look at the integer kinds. And first, we're going to ask, can one of, is one kind less than or equal to the other? Are they ordered? Um, and if they are, things are pretty easy. So if one kind, it, it, if there's a bigger kind and a smaller kind, then we will convert the, the operand of smaller kind into the type that has bigger kind, and then they will match, and it'll be a nice conversion. We like that case, uh, those two cases, because it could happen in either direction. If, the, if they have the same kind, despite being different types, then we're going to have to break the tie somehow. Um, and if they have kinds that are incomparable, we're gonna have to do something less pleasant. But let's look at the more pleasant one. Um, we break the tie if they have the same kind by using integer conversion rank. We could convert either way. There is a magic property of integer types that we can use to break ties here. Um, and I will say, I made this template up. There is no integer conversion rank template in the standard. I didn't put STD in front of it. Um, so there isn't a way to directly ask. But if we could ask how the integer um, conversion ranks compare, um, we would convert to the one that, ha that has um, greater rank. Um, lesser rank. I forget which way it goes. Um, but the code's there. Um, and now we do know some things from the standard. We know that long, long beats long, long beats int. We know that if, an, if a standard type and an extended type have the same kind, then the standard type wins. Um, the thing we don't know and we don't have any way to get at directly is if we have two extended types that have the same kind, so they're interconvertible, but they're different types, we don't know which one wins. Um, so, little thing missing there. Now we get to the hard part. Um, if the two kinds are incomparable, which happens because one of them is signed and one of them is unsigned, but they have the same width. You can't go either way safely. So what do we do then? Um, if we can't convert either way, uh, what we're going to do is convert the signed one to unsigned. I'm going to convert the unsigned one to unsigned also, so leave it alone. Um, and then try again. And being both unsigned, they, they will be, or they, they will um, either be the same type or they will be um, two types that we can break the tie with integer rank. Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to convert modular to an unsigned type. Convert modular again. Sometimes you get the wrong answer. And this one is really dangerous. This is the one that makes negative numbers sometimes appear to be greater than zero because you are comparing to an unsigned zero. Um, so you got to watch out for this one in C++. It is an easy thing to trip over. Turn on your compiler warnings. Maybe they'll save you. They won't always save you. Um, so this one 
danger spot in the language. Now, this rather complex bit of working out the um, uniform arithmetic conversions is, of course, again, not what you would write in practice. What you would write in practice is you would say, well, they're going to convert to the type that plus returns. So we can do a little decal type and just ask the compiler, what does plus give us? That's what uniform, that's what the usual, usual, not uniform, arithmetic conversions give us. Um, and then writing the function is easy. We're just going to convert modular to that type. Kind of lost the information that, if we were lucky, it was a, it was a nice conversion. Um, anyway, with that in hand, we can do interfaces for binary operations where the types don't match. And here, requires clause, if the types don't match, we are going to apply the usual arithmetic conversions and then apply the operation we wanted to begin with, and that will compute the expected result. Um, and that's how we get rid of uh, of parameters that don't match, except in one case. Um, in C++, we carve out two binary operations where we don't do that, left and right shift. We leave the, we don't do the usual arithmetic conversions. We're just happy to work on things that are in different types there. We do promote. Um, and uh, that's actually a good call, in my opinion not messing with the right-hand operands type because it's an exponent and things get weirder than you would like if you mess too much with your exponents. But anyway, those two are just an exception to this rule. Um, and honestly, I'd probably be happier if all types were, or all operations were an exception to this rule. Promotion and the usual arithmetic conversions, I think, do not help us. Um, so, moving on, there are a couple of preconditions that are specially called out in the standard for particular operations that I'm going to talk about now. Um, there's um, a kind of complicated um, uh, so, some complicated things for slash and percent operations. Um, here we have, if the second operand of slash or percent is zero, the behavior is undefined. Now, the behavior is undefined sounds like a post condition. It's talking about the behavior of the function. What happened when you called this function? But it's not. It's a precondition because undefined behavior is total freedom on the part of the implementation of the function. You never want to give a function total freedom. So instead, it's on the caller to avoid calling the function in a way that would give it total freedom. Whenever you see undefined behavior, looks like post condition, it's a precondition. Um, and then we have a more complicated thing. If the quotient a slash b is representable in the type of the result, um, there's some math. Um, otherwise, the behavior of both a slash b and a percent b is undefined. This portion of a sentence is actually, actually contains both a precondition and a postcondition. The first part, the bit with the math, that's a postcondition. It is fairly straightforward, uh, fairly straightforwardly about the result of the function. The other half, the behavior is undefined part, that's a precondition. Um, and what's that about? That's, this is about dividing the most negative number of assigned type by minus one. So there's one more negative number than there, is, than there are positive numbers in assigned type. One extra negative number that has no corresponding positive number. Um, and um, when you um, divide by minus one, you end up trying, aiming for that positive number that exists. 
So that's the case where you get undefined behavior from slash, and by this rule, also from percent, even though the proper result would be zero. So we just don't like doing that. Some architecture it didn't work on back in the day, I'm sure. Um, so that's the precondition here. Don't divide the most negative number by minus one. Um, and for the shift operations, there's also a um, precondition. The behavior is undefined if the right operand is negative or greater than or equal to the width of the promoted left operand. So that one is fairly straightforward once you realize that behavior being undefined is a precondition. Um, and we can write all of that in code here. For a slash b, we just claim that b is not zero. For a percent b, we claim that b is not equal to zero and that we can compute the quotient. So if we can't compute the quotient and get its preconditions out of the way, we'll get back to the pre, uh, that other precondition on the quotient. Um, but if we can't compute the quotient, we can't do percent. Um, there's our po little post condition, the math from that line. Um, and down below, we have the condition on the right-hand operand of shift. Um, we are going to convert to bit size t. Um, for my purposes today, I, I will say bit size t should not be an integral type. It shouldn't follow all the nasty rules for how integral types work. Um, instead, um, think of it as its own thing with its own rules. It's kind of, it, it, it's things measured in units of bits, unsigned units of bits. So you can't convert a negative number to bit size t. So this is, that covers the convert narrowing, covers that. The comparison covers things that fit in bit size t but are too large. And of course, things that don't even fit in bit size t can't, um, be, con can't be converted narrowing. So now we come to the hard precondition that is across many of these operations. If during the evaluation of an expression, the result is not mathematically defined or not in the range of representable values for its type, the behavior is undefined. Um, that's going to cause us some trouble. I should say it only causes us some trouble for some types and operations because it is modified by two things elsewhere in the standard. Um, it doesn't apply to unsigned types. We're going to do a convert modular to get out of this undefined behavior. And it doesn't apply to left shift. We're again going to do a convert modular to get out of this undefined behavior. Um, and But for for sign types where we're not going to be um, uh, doing a left shift, we have this undefined behavior, a precondition, even though it looks like a postcondition. But this one's really weird because this is a precondition that is about the result of the operation. How the heck does that work? How do you write a precondition that depends on the result of the operation? And the answer is, you don't. This is a really strangely worded thing, and it means something different from what the words mean on their face. Um, let's go back to our diagram of types. And suppose we are doing some operation here, um, what it's talking about here is what would happen if we pushed this operation using our nice conversions down to Z, did the operation in Z, and then tried to lift the, oper uh, lift the result back to the type where we started. And because we're lifting, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's what it's getting at. It's asking, does that lift after you did the operation in Z, 
work. So we can write that. Um, we can say we're going to convert to z. We are going to compute an expected result by lifting back to the type we started with. Um, and we are putting it on the caller that that lift works. So that, that's how we can express this. It wasn't actually talking about the result of the operation. It was talking about the result of a similar operation happening in a different type. Um, but there's a problem with this. Z is not really a type. It's the co-limit of types. It's off on the horizon. But it's not a type in our computer. It's not a real C++ type. Um, so how do we get rid of that conversion to Z? And for that, we're going to need a little category theory. Here is our diagram, our co-limit diagram, where we want to do some math. Um, and but this is a special sort of diagram. Any two types in the diagram are brought together by nice conversions before you get to Z, before you get to the colon. Any two types will come together. And that makes this a filtered diagram. Um, and when you take the colimit of a filtered diagram, you get a nice property. And that is, if there is some finitely presentable thing happening in the colimit, and a single operation with a finite number of parameters is a finitely presentable thing. If we have some finitely presentable operation with its result, we can lift that whole thing up somewhere in the diagram. Not necessarily to where we wanted to lift it in the diagram, but it will lift to somewhere in the diagram. And we can take advantage of that to express what would happen in Z if Z were a type um, without actually going all the way to Z. We can just go far enough to make our computation work. Um, but for that, I am going to have to invent some new actual types, and I'm going to call these the widening types. So these are types that I'm going to use to represent integers, but I'm going to get away from all that nastiness we had before. It doesn't have any of that stuff listed on the left side of the, of the slide. Um, but the idea of the widening types is you can ask for any kind of widening type, and that's the kind you're going to get. Um, it has operations with results that are generally wider than their parameters. Almost all of the widening operations will return, uh, will return a, a result that is a little wider than either of its parameters. And the last thing is they're going to have operations that agree with Z. That is, they will be, for each operation, I will make sure we're computing it far enough out that we can take all the computations that could, be pre that could be done in the types we started with and successfully do them in that widening type and successfully represent both the operands and the result in that widening type. So, the, so it steps down the diagram far enough to do the work we need. Um, with that, we can define um, how, uh, we, we can give an interface for, um, or we, we can um, talk about a wide, you know, how to compute how far enough out you need to go. And there's simple expressions that do it for plus here, and plus is going to be my example from now on. Um, what you do is you find the first place where the two meet and you go one bit further out, and that's far enough to, to add anything from the types you started with. Um, and there are other rules for the other operations. And I'm going to call that the sum of the two kinds. It's the sum of the two kinds is the place you would go to compute sums from those kinds. Um, and with that, I can do a declaration for widening plus. And that's how all the widening operations are going to work. 
We won't have any in-place operations, of course. Um, the in-place operations couldn't work because we're returning a type that doesn't match either of the parameters. Um, but before we can use it, we're going to need conversions to and from the widening types. And the important thing there is just that we're going to have a bijection. So we have a fairly simple interface we'd like to write here that to widening inverts from widening and from widening inverts to widening. But this is recursive. This is no good. You don't want your interfaces to be recursive like this. Uh, so we're just going to have to apply a little trick to break the recursion. Here we had two widening depending on from widening and vice versa, but we're going to add a couple of functions, primitive to widening, primitive from widening, that break the recursion. This Now we don't have any loops, um, and they just do the same thing. They just don't give us as strong a post condition. Um, so with that, doing that trick, um, we can, for two widening, have two post uh, parts of the post conditions. Two widening does the same thing as primitive two widening, and, prim and two widening inverts primitive from widening. Um, likewise, uh, from widening does the same thing as primitive from widening, and it inverts primitive to widening. There we have bijection without the recursion. And with that, we can come back to our interface for plus um, that converted to Z and rewrite it so that we are converting to the, uh, to the appropriate widening type in both cases. We do the math. We figure out what widening type we need to lift to. We do the lift differently if it's signed or unsigned. Unsigned, we silently get the wrong thing. Um, sometimes for signed, we convert narrowing. It's on the caller to make sure that we can convert. And of course, a little different for shifts. Um, but um, that's how we get our, our lifted result. And we use from widening to get that back into an integral type. And our result is equal to the expected result. That's how the interfaces for all the remaining operations work um, on integral types. So now um, we really have just two classes here. Um, we have things that we need to define for widening types. And we have, I, I will say, that was all the operations except for shift. For shift, let's just leave the result in bit, or the right hand side in bit size t. It works better. So we're only going to um, take the left hand to widening. And I should say that rule that you can't shift by more than the width of the um, type you have makes, makes it so that we do have a widening type where we can do all the shifts in. Because um, we only have to double, double the number of bits less one. Um, to tell us how far we can shift. Ah, and so now we really just have to talk about widening math. And there is one more set of rules in the C++ standard, or maybe I should say one more set of rules that largely isn't in the C++ standard. Well, what's written in the standard looks like this. Um, the result of the binary plus operator is the sum of the operands. That's what it has to say about what addition really is. This isn't so much specification as abdication of specification. Um, you know, you, unless you knew what plus did already, you couldn't read this. Um, but let's go with it. What can we say about this? Um, well, I'm actually going to just write an interface for plus that shuffles off to another function, add with carry. I'm, I'm going to just make a little indirection here. And, but that's the interface for plus that I'm going to use. We compute the, res the expected result for widening plus 
by doing add with carry on widening types. What is add with carry? It's a very similar function that has three parameters, third one defaulted. The, thir the third one is a one-bit widening unsigned type, which I'm giving the alias positive bit. Um, and it defaults to the default constructed one. So if you don't pass one, you carry zero. Um, but this is the interface for add with carry, and it's very straightforward. Uh, we need immunity for all three parameters. Caller has to assure us they won't change. All three parameters affect the result of the function. We're going to discern, or we're going to say they are all part of the discernible input. Um, we are producing a new object that didn't exist before, so we are going to um, hand the the right to that object, to the stability of that object, to our caller. Um, and that object will contain the discernible output. And I left blank. There must be something important that goes in that blank, because otherwise this is going to look like any other function with or almost any other function with these parameters. Um, but I am going to leave it very nearly blank. I'm just going to put a comment there. Uh, for a post condition about the value of the result, call reference add axiom. So I'm doing another bit of indirection here for a different reason. The next bit is going to be full of branches. There's going to be a bunch of branches. There's a whole lot of code. If you walk through all of it, and I want to save callers of this function from having all of that when they don't need it. So I'm going to shuffle off to a different, um, to a different function. If you need that post condition, you call the axiom. So what does an axiom look like? Uh, here is the reference add axiom. Um, the precondition is that you can compute something I'm going to call the reference sum with reference add with carry. Um, the post condition is that the actual sum from add with carry would be the same, at, not, this, not the thing we're returning. We're not returning anything. This is just an axiom. Um, but the actual sum, the one that you would get from add with carry, would be equal to or would be substitutable for the thing we got from reference, from reference add with carry. So really what this axiom is saying is just that two differently named functions will produce the same result. That's all this axiom is saying. Um, there is a special word here, posit. Posit is the word that makes this an axiom. This is a function interface that doesn't have an implementation. It does nothing. We are just supposed to be convinced because it is the implementation's job to make this axiom work. But we are supposed to be convinced that the preconditions will lead to the postconditions logically with nothing happening in between. So that's what posit implementation means. It means assume that there is some reason the postcondition will be true. Um, if the precondition is true. So this one, it's the, that reason is outside the language. It's we expect compilers to be written in such a way that these two functions will give the same value. And I'm going to say there's a, um, you know, I thought I was doing a little clever trickery here. I got two functions. They, they return the same value, and it's just a kind of programming dodge. Um, this actually appears in Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. Uh, this is what the axiom of reducibility is for. It's basically saying that, yeah, I, I did a bunch of work and made this function. Yeah, there's another simpler way to get at that same answer that I'm just going to give a name to. That's what reducibility does. Um, so, and it, it gets around a problem with that, you know, it plus type theory gets around Russell's paradox, which was, which 
all of the logicist programs were falling to before the Principia Mathematica. Um, so um, it's just a dodge to get you out of a kind of recursion that causes trouble. Uh, and in our case, it's a dodge to get out of injecting a ton of if statements into our callers. Ah, so now the question is, what is this reference add with carry? Well, for there, um, you know, I'm going to say it's an inline function that just shows you what the result of add with carry ought to be. Um, so what is that result? Well, you may have seen this before. Suppose we're adding two numbers and we have a, a, a bit that we're carrying. Um, what we can do is split each number into a high digit and a low digit. We can add the low digits to get a two digit result, split that into a high digit and a low digit, use the high digit as a carry to um, add up, when we add up the high digits, now we have two parts to our result and we, have, we can join them together just shoving the digits together to make, our, to, to make the result of our, of our addition. So that is reference add with carry. This is what we would do if we were wondering whether our program is adding correctly. This is why the standard could say it's the sum of the operands. We learned this algorithm in school, I hope, um, and we all agree that this algorithm is what it means to take the sum. This is what addition is. Um, and we can write this algorithm in code. Uh, we need a couple of uh, extra functions here. We're going to have split bits and join bits for taking them apart and putting them together digit wise. Um, and what do we do? We split the bits of both of them. We add the low bits. We split the bits of the result of adding the low bits. We do another add with carry using that upper bit as a carry. And then we join them back together to get our result. That is reference add with carry. Uh, I put this, I made this an inline function. It sits in, the idea is it sits in the headers. It's not hidden behind an interface. The code is the interface for this function. It's whoever is calling this just has to make sure that this code is going to work. Um, and they can see this is how we got to that number. Um, now I should say this is only one case for add with carry. I put a big if const expert here. This is the case where the two types both have more than one bit. And when we split the bits, we get the same number of bits on both sides. Uh, this low width function, the one I imagine when doing this is low width is the greatest power of two less than the width of the uh, of the larger type of width of the kind. Um, and that you, using greatest power of two gets a nice binary reduction factor, but also focuses every uh, a great deal of the math on types that are, have power of two widths. So you, if you're doing this in many different widths, you end up with a lot of the math going to the same place, which is nice. Um, and so that's the low width I'm imagining. Um, so there's a case for, well, if one of the numbers is really wide and the other one isn't, then you don't want to split the, the, the one that's not very wide. Um, and that could happen in either way. There's, so there's two cases for that. It could be A, it could be B. Um, and, or it could be A, B, or it could be C, D, depending. Um, there are also cases for zero-bit integers, unsigned one-bit integers, signed one-bit integers. So that's another nine cases. There are 12 cases in all. Who knew that addition had 12 cases that we have to consider? Um, but anyway, uh, that's this case, which is arguably the hardest. Though 
the code for adding up two one-bit numbers is actually considerably nastier. This is the case for two unsigned one-bit numbers. What are we going to do? We're going to convert everything to bool using this function bit to bool, and we're going to branch on it. And so we're going to have nested branches three deep, and we're going to choose an answer, and we're going to stick two bits together to figure out what our answer is. So I don't really expect you to read all of this, although I will hint that if we were trying to prove that one plus one is equal to two, it's somewhere on this slide is the key line to look at. Um, but here's a picture of what's going on. We have three branches, in, you know, in a row. There are eight possible ways, eight paths through this code. There's one answer chosen on each path. Um, and there are only four possible answers because it's a two-bit answer. Some of the answers get repeated on different paths. But that's how we do it. Eight, eight choices, four possible answers. And with that, we're down to just split bits, bit to bool, bool to bit, oh, join bits. And we, we need a corresponding um, signed version of bit to bool so that we can talk about signed one bit numbers. Um, so that's all the stuff that's left. Uh, the bottom four are just pairs that are in bijections. We know how to do them. Um, split bits and join bits, nearly a bijection. There's a weird fiddly case where you join two things together and then you split them and you split at a different place from where you joined them. Um, so it's not quite a bijection, but it's, uh, it's close and it's not very interesting. So I'm going to just leave those as exercises to the viewer and move on to something more interesting. Um, what's more interesting than figuring out nearly a bi an interface for nearly a bijection? Um, what can you do with all of this once you have this? When we have formal interfaces for all of our arithmetic, what can we do with that? The answer is, well, one of the answers is we can prove theorems. Here's a theorem. A theorem is an interface. A theorem is saying, if you meet the preconditions, if you meet the premises of the theorem, then you will meet the postconditions, the conclusions of the theorem. Um, so it's a function that doesn't actually do anything. It's basically, the, the implementation is basically one big assertion that links the preconditions to the postconditions. It shows you how to logically get from one to the other without doing, you know, you could execute it the same way you can execute actual con um, it, you know, other assertions if you compile them in, but it's not actually doing anything to forward the program. It's just demonstrating that you could do this to check your reasoning. So, that's why I use claim implementation as the proof. It's the implementation itself is an assertion. It's the proof that you can go from these preconditions to the postconditions. And the preconditions here that you can add with carry in either direction uh, for these parameters, um, and that at the end, the, the um, the parameters will be, or the results will be substitutable. So we do the add with, we flip one of the, we do two add with carries, one with the two main parameters reversed, we get the same result. That's what the theorem is saying. And I apologize if you can't quite see the gray stuff, that seems to be washed out today. Um, and uh, so what happened, so, how do we prove that you'll get the same result either way? Well, we're going to fall back on our principles, stability, substitutability, and repeatability. And we're just going to use them a whole bunch. 
And we're going to start off by calling reference add axiom, which calls referen uh, reference add with carry, which does all of this work out in the open, not hidden behind an interface. So we see it do all of this work to compute the sum of A, B, and C, D. And then we're going to start over repeating some of that work. So we're going to get the same answers. We're going to do that same split. And by repeatability, we're going to get the same answer. We're going to get like answers. We're going to be repeating the answers. Um, and we're going to use that split in the, the low bits in addition is commutative. This isn't recursive, by the way. This is calling a different specialization of the same template because it, we're calling it on narrower integers. Um, so we add the low bits and we see that, yeah, the low bits we could add in either direction. And then we're going to continue repeating things from, reference, uh, from our reference add axiom to figure out what the addition was that it used for the high bits. And we're repeating this just so that we can match up with what was going on before. Um, and then we can take those and again, apply addition as commute. If we could um, use, we could add them, you know, we could add A and C in either order. Um, and then we're done with repeating stuff that was in the reference add axiom, but we're, we're going to call reference add axiom another time with the parameters reversed. And every operation here either repeats something that was going on in the first call to reference add axiom, or it is repeating something that happened in one of the calls to addition is commutative. Um, and in addition is commutative, we showed that it was substitutable for something that was repeating the first reference add axiom. So everything we are doing in this second call is something that is either done before in, well, something that has been done before and that has some path that leads it back to how it was done in the first call to reference add axiom. And of course, the two axioms are assuring us that the result of reference add, which we saw here, is also substitutable for add, the result of add with carry. That's what the axiom says. So that's the whole proof. And we can write the code, but it's the same thing. We call reference add axiom, we split the bits, we split the bits, we call addition is commutative. We then do another, Oh, so, sorry, we, yeah, we do addition is commutative. We do an add with carry to repeat what was happening in the reference add axiom. Um, we split the bits there and call another addition is commutative on the, on the high digits. And once we've done that, we call reference add axiom the other way around. And if you just follow through the code in a purely mechanical fashion, keeping track of what's stable, what's being repeated, and what's, being, and what's substitutable, it becomes clear that you got the result, both the same result, both times they will be substitutable. So that's the proof. And it's, I know some people will look at this and say, that's code. Proofs don't look like code. But proofs can look like code. They are just the expression in a formal language of how mathematics goes. So this is both executable code and a mathematical proof. Um, so again, this is only the, the case where um, we had, where, where we do split both. We have the one bit cases and, and the ones where we only split one, you know, one operand and we would have to cover that, but they're pretty, you know, the, the ones where you split one operand, pretty similar. Um, the one bit cases, I'll show you a one bit case. Here's the picture for the one bit case. Again, we had eight different paths to the code when we added two one bit numbers. If we do it again, we have eight different paths, but interestingly, each branch 
in the second edition is repeating some branch from the first edition. That is, we're branching on the same, well, we're, we repeated um, bit to bool, and we got the same bool result. So, and when we branch, we repeat the branch, we go the same direction. So the path through the first edition tells us what the path through the second edition is. And we just note that in every case, the answer we chose for what is the sum of these two bits is repeated. We calculated the sum of the two bits by joining this, you know, by, with a join expression, and it joined exactly the same values. So it's going to produce the same result in every case. So eight different cases to this proof, but you can get the same answer every time. And again, we could just walk through the code and see it. So in this case, the proof is very simple. We call reference add axiom one way, we call reference add axiom the other way, and we say, just look through it, it's obvious. A machine can do that. A machine can track the, substitu the substitutability and repeatability there and say, we're get, and yes, and the stability, it has to know that the parameters are stable. Um, and it'll just say, yes, you got substitutable results there. So, that's how we do proofs. We can just write code that does proofs. We could teach this as something that you just learn as you're learning to code because it's the same skill, um, just a little different language, very little different language. Um, so I want to, to end, return to this picture, our co-limit diagram. Um, and I want to complain a little bit about the way I was brought up and perhaps many of you were brought up. Uh, the way I was taught, it's very easy to think of this thing Z at the bottom as being the true thing. It's, it is the, the thing where math really happens. And the others are just shadows of that thing. They are approximations of Z. They are, to borrow a metaphor, the shadows cast on a cave wall by the light shone by Z. Um, that's a pernicious way of thinking. That will mess you up. And I have spent a lot of time trying to excise that from my thinking. Because these things on top, these are the real things. These are the things that are in the world with us. These are the things that our computers are computing with. And if we're trying to write a really good specification of how something works, we should be writing it in terms of things that are in the real world with us not some co-limit that is a mirage off on the horizon that we will never meet, reach. <sighs> and on that note, thank you for listening. <clears throat> <clears throat>